Hello everybody and welcome to our podcast. We met a journalist called Ashley John Baptiste who now works at the BBC as part of Changing Futures Week at University of Northampton. And Changing Futures Week is a week when industry professionals talk to the students. And I'm Lily Burke. I'm Lily Baird. I'm Mary Fashoni. I'm Sana Vashush. Between the ages of 2 and 18 years old, I was shunted between four foster homes and a residential care home. That's five moves, five moments of trauma, five moments where I felt like my world had crumbled, five moments where I became really insecure about my identity, who loved me, who I belonged to, as you can imagine. I can't remember the first home that I lived in because I was really young. But the second home that I went to live in, I remember heaps. I was sent to live with a lady called Sissy. She was this larger than life, Caribbean lady, full of energy, full of character, incredible cook, jerk chicken, macaroni and cheese, rice and peas. You know, I like that type of food. Sissy was an incredible cook. Her family made me feel really welcome and at home. And for all of the trauma that I experienced in the care system, at Sissy's I felt love. Her grandchildren were like my brothers and sisters. And her children were like my aunties and uncles, and for all of the trauma that I had experienced in the care system with Sissy, I felt at home. I thought I was going to live with Sissy for the rest of my life. However, when I got to around eight years old, Sissy decided that she no longer wanted to look after me. And I can still remember the day that I had to leave Sissy's house. It felt like a normal spring morning. I was in the living room, I was eating cereal, watching children's telly as you do when you're a kid when you're eight years old. It was a normal morning when a car of social workers pulled up to the house. A worker got into the, uh, came into the house and he told me, Ash, Lee, you have to leave this home. And a group of social workers forced me into the back of their car. I began to weep, I was kicking, I was screaming, fighting them off, begging Sissy to take me back. And they forced me into the back of their car. And I remember looking through the back window. Sissy was now stood outside the house. I remember looking at Sissy, banging the window, begging her, take me back. And the car drove off. And she got smaller and smaller until she disappeared outside. From there, I went to live in a residential care home. It's uh, essentially what I would call a glorified orphanage. I was sent to live in this home. There were around eight guys my age. And in that home, we didn't have consistent parental figures. There was no sissy in that home. There was no sense of family, there was no love. Rather, we had shift workers. So from nine to five, a batch of workers would come. They would supervise us kids. They would leave, go home to their families. And then another batch would come and stay overnight. And day after day, this would rotate like clockwork. I don't know if any of you have any experience of, you know, kind of being turfed from your family, but being in the children's home really was pretty brutal. From there I moved to another family, and then one more family until at 18 years old, I was given keys to a council flat. I was told that I was no longer the responsibility of the state because I was now a care leaver. And I remember being in that council flat Extremely so as you heard, Ashley has spoke to us about his life story so far. I do think studying journalism and covering so many stories from like inquests or anything else that we cover here at university, it does sometimes make us a bit immune to covering certain stories as a journalist, but I think he came in and showed a different side to journalism shows that not everybody is rich and famous that gets into the journalism industry. Yeah, I think that because of his background, I mean, it's almost helped him sort of get into that industry, which is quite inspiring because not everyone in the foster care system gets them opportunities. So I think it's quite nice that he's used that to his full potential. I think that was quite motivational to hear. I and mean, it's quite inspiring when you hear things like that because it makes you feel like you can do it no matter what background you're from. It is possible. And it also shows like how much like it doesn't matter what industry you're from, you can still eventually make it. All you just need is motivation, dedication, and the right, pe- even though you don't have the right people around you, you can still do what you want to do because you believe in yourself. And that shows that sometimes, even though your lecturers don't believe, your teachers don't believe, you need to believe in yourself because at the end of the day, it's your life, it's your future, and it's 
you have to do what you have to do to like make it in life pretty much i would say it's never too late to decide what you want to do in future so even despite of he being in care homes and didn't have parents to support or because he said he kept on changing his foster homes and all of that he wasn't he didn't have permanent people in his life or but still he went up and became a journalist after that i think the support as well he sort of mentioned that that he didn't have the support like other people probably would that he was surrounded by so i think that's quite nice that he's sort of done it without the support from you know parental figures things like that yeah it's just inspiring to think that you can make it. Despite all of that, I had academic potential. So I was a kid who would actually get by academically, but get extremely bored and then become really dysfunctional. For my GCSEs, I'd finally moved to my final foster family. And for the first time, I had a foster dad. That was actually really significant, having a positive male, a black male role model. So to have a positive foster dad was a big deal. This family actually changed the outcome for me and I was fortunate to get really good GCSEs despite my legacy of underachievement, despite my legacy of not doing that great, I went on to get A stars, A's and B's. So I was shocked, the school was shocked. This was an underachievement school in South London. It was a state school that didn't do well academically. But because of these grades, a charity called the Sutton Trust invited me to spend a week at Cambridge University as an A-level student. So I was offered this opportunity, Ashley, would you like to go to Cambridge for a week to study history? I said, hell no. <laughs> Why would a black kid from Cambridge want to go to Cambridge for a week? It shows how I saw myself. It shows the perceptions I had of Oxbridge, but I just thought it wasn't for me. But I had a teacher who was relentless in persuading me to go, so reluctantly, I went to Cambridge for a week. I thought I would hate it, I thought that I would just, you know, struggle to get by, but actually, I loved it. My state school in London was underprivileged, but walking through the grand courts of Cambridge, hearing from world-class lecturers, it really did inspire my outlook. And there were peers of this summer school from across the UK, different parts of England, different nations, and I remember being um, with some of my peers over lunch, one of the days at the summer school. And we were having a chat about the Houses of Parliament. Now, at one point, whilst I was in care, I lived just off the Old Kent Road, which is literally down the road from the Houses of Parliament. In this conversation, where I was with peers from other parts of the UK, I was the least informed, despite my proximity geographically to living near the Houses of Parliament. So we were having this chat, but I wasn't informed, so I couldn't contribute to the discussion. For the first time, I realised the importance of being informed. My bravado wasn't enough. My fake confidence wasn't enough in this discussion. I was just not informed. And as a result of that conversation with peers, I had a new aspiration. I went back to London deciding that I wanted to become educated. I wanted to go to Cambridge and study history. Went back to my sixth form, stayed on at my school, went to sixth form, and I told the head of that sixth form, Miss, I really want to go to Cambridge and study history. She looked at me as if I was smoking a recreational drug. In that moment, I could have reverted back to the guy who got in trouble, the guy who disengaged, the guy who was dysfunctional. But I decided that I wanted to go above and beyond to prove to this teacher that I had the potential to go to Cambridge. So from hanging out with mates like most people on the weekend, I began to read about Hitler's Germany on a Friday night. I was so down. <laughs> and I would write essays like, I wasn't obliged under compulsion to write. I just wanted to improve my craft uh, as a writer and someone who understood this period of history. I remember giving my teacher an essay and I said, would you consider giving me a good reference for a Cambridge interview? She was gobsmacked at the initiative I had taken and so she gave me a reference. Story short, guys, I got offered an interview to, to, to go to Cambridge as an undergrad. I remember going to these interviews and hearing how people spoke, yellow how they looked or anything like that. They just sounded so posh. And I, just by virtue of how they sounded, I disqualified myself. I told myself there's no way that I'm gonna do well in these interviews. There's no way that I'm gonna compared to these people who seem so self-assured and confident and posh. But I did my best, went back home, and I was gutted because I 
you know, I thought I flopped. A couple months later, I got a letter. I got an offer to study at Cambridge. So now that we've heard Ashley's story this far, overall, what did you guys think of it so far? I think that, again, it's he's stating that you can achieve what you want if you put your mind to it. And I think that the whole university thing about how he went and they were all posh and they weren't like him, it sort of shows that controversy is OK and he's still made it to where he wants to be, even though he's not the typical white posh person that was at the university that I think he thought that he had to be. But it shows that he, he didn't have to be that, he could be himself and look how far he's come. At such a young age, I think it's quite impressive from you know his background as well. I think it is really sort of motivational that he has got this far. Um, also because I'm from South London, so when I heard that, it's kind of like a motivational speech for me. And it was like, it was it hit more close to home, kind of, if you could get where I'm coming from. Also because like, he said um, when he went to Cambridge University, he felt like, oh my gosh, I'm left out. Everyone is doing this. They have their family with them. And then he just felt really lonely at that point. And then it just makes you feel like it doesn't matter even how you feel at a certain point in life you always bounce back and be even better. I would say the same thing. It was more of a motivational speech rather than talking about journalism to us. Another thing that he mentioned was even though he had a lot of struggles that he faced, he still wanted to go to Cambridge to study history. I mean, he liked it when he just visited to Cambridge for a week. And I think what he's trying to show to us or whatever he's trying to convey to us is that wherever you come from, whatever background you're coming from whatever struggles you've faced if you've got an aim in life you can achieve it and also i feel like anyone could relate to this as well because it doesn't matter what race you are what country you're from anyone could be in a situation where they have nobody with them like some people are fortunate to have um people some people are not so even though you have families or friends or you don't even though you have families you could feel lonely you could feel like you you're alone in this world so pretty much anyone could relate to it any age any race and in the industry pretty much. So Ashley said to us at the start of the talk that the journalism industry can be seen as like quite an elitist industry for rich people. Like hearing him talk from the background that it's come from, has that changed your perspective on the journalism industry as you, like we are studying journalism? Yeah, I think it shows that you don't have to have money behind you and you don't have to have, you know, this whole persona that people make out to be a journalist. I think that he probably proves that in a way. So it's quite nice to hear from someone that hasn't had probably the background that most journalists we've heard from before have. He's sort of had a complete different background that's not been as structured and it's obviously not been very nice for him. And I think the conversation that he was talking about, about the conversation he had with his friends when he was at Cambridge for the week summer school about the parliament, I think that's, it's quite nice that probably that made him realise. I feel like situations in his life have probably made him think, oh, you know, maybe I do want to do that or actually I do want to be informed on things like that. So I think, yeah, certain situations that have happened to him have sort of gave him the motivation to go out and do what he wanted to do, which I think it's almost like a bad situation has made a few good, good, you know, situations from it because he sort of felt disadvantaged, which has made him think, no, I don't want to feel that anymore. I think he's proved the people wrong by saying that journalism is a field for only the elite people or the rich people. If uh, I was to talk about my country back in India, I think to some extent journalism is a field for the rich people or the elite people. But because of the speech that he gave, I think he proved everyone wrong. Um, I think every country has the same thing. He means to say that anywhere you come from, whether you're rich or maybe you don't have a family or whatever, you can, you can just end up in journalism as well. And also what I love about journalism because the stories that we get is always about different situations. It could be about someone in the middle class, upper class or lower class. So it makes it more, more free to everyone because the stories were not always the same thing. So even though you're from the lower class, you wouldn't feel left out because you still report any story anyone would report. So for that reason, I love how journalism is set up, even though usually it's always for a certain group of people, but now it's for everyone because everyone can relate to any story. Sonia, do you think that this is like this is something that could work in India as well? Do you think, because I don't know the journalism system out there, but do you think that it's something that could happen in India as well as in the UK? Yeah, I would say it does happen. Yeah, I wouldn't say no. Uh, it does happen, but there are very few people who would come up and talk in public about it and not really discuss it with people. Do you no one like to tell them. They would feel they're like, like, oh, like putting themselves they feel down. Low. Yeah, yeah okay. they don't want to. Do you feel like people are more open here than they probably would As be in India? As compared to India, yeah, yeah, yeah. Days after graduating from Cambridge, I found myself at the O2 Arena 
in front of Louis Walsh, Talisa, Gabby Barlow, and Kelly Rowland. I was auditioning for The X Factor. <laughs> I know you're like, oh, are you making this up? It's true. I was auditioning for The X Factor. Whilst they needed some extended to audition for the show, so I sent in a YouTube audition. The producers liked it, so days later, having graduated from Cambridge, I was on the O2 Arena doing my TV audition. Story short, I got put in a band that, if you can Google it by the way, it's called, we were called The Risk. I was put in a boy band at boot camp and we made it to judges' houses and Talisa was our judge and we went to her villa, definitely not her villa, in Mykonos and we auditioned during judges' houses and then we made it to the live finals. So months after graduating from Cambridge, I find myself in the final 12 on the X Factor doing the live finals and the for me for National Telly. It was nuts. And it, such a whirlwind. By week three of the live shows, our group was tipped to win. And um, I had a bit of an epiphany, guys. I remember after one of the shows, one of the live shows, going to our dressing room. And we were in the dressing room with all the other acts that were, were still around. I was, I was with the wanted, Kelly Road, and all the judges. And I remember thinking, I'm not fulfilling my potential here. As great as this is, and as desirable as this may be for some people, can I just say, back then the x Factor was a lot bigger than it is now, I'm sure you remember, but it was a big deal. And I just said, longevity is important to me, a lifelong career is important to me, using my brain is important to me, I've just gained a Cambridge degree, but on that show, I felt as if I was giving it away. So I made a pretty big decision. I decided to quit the show week five of the live finals. I was followed by the press for about two weeks and then boom, I was back in anonymity with no sense of what I wanted to do in my life. So this is where it really becomes pertinent to you as journalists and people in the media. So I quit the show, no idea of what I wanted to do. And then I got a tweet from BBC Three, as you do. They wanted to have a meeting with me to talk about a potential documentary. At this point, it was 2013. BBC3 was still on TV, so it was before they went digital. And they basically wanted me to present a documentary about the foster care system. Obviously, they'd heard about my story, they'd seen me on the X Factor, and they thought I might be good as someone to present a BBC3 documentary about the care system. Now, well, I had just run away from the spotlight, so I was pretty reluctant to do it but they offered me money and I was broke so I did it and doing this documentary was actually life-changing I, I loved the inquiring nature I loved the art of questioning people asking things that you wouldn't normally ask in everyday life I loved meeting new people I loved scripting it I loved the editorial process the documentary went out on the TV it was a six-minute special it got over a million views it did really well in the papers and so I had a new aspiration. I wanted to become a journalist. Because of the success of that documentary, BBC News offered me a traineeship. So I trained up with the BBC for 12 months. I started off on the BBC News Channel, and then I got halfway through my internship, I got offered the chance to join the launch team of the Victoria Derbyshire programme. So I joined the launch team of her programme, and I was on that programme for three years. So from being a trainee, I then got offered a job as a producer, and then I became a reporter. Spent three years on that program, and by way of time and kind of not making this too long, I am, as I speak to you now, I am a senior digital reporter for, for BBC News. Yeah, so now his relating to the bit that we need, which is the journalism industry. I think it was really, it took him a while to get to the bit that was relevant to us, in all honesty, in my opinion. I don't think he really went in depth either, did he, about no. his sort of journalism career, which is sort of what we what wanted. We're here to do. <laughs> yeah. And the thing as well, he said that you just got a tweet from the BBC, which is really good, but like the rest of it, like us sitting here now don't have the capability yeah. to just randomly get a tweet from the BBC. I feel you like know, that come from the X Factor, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, it was sort of luck, whereas it wasn't sort of a journey that he... I, I get that he went to, you know, Cambridge, but it wasn't 
a journalism journey that he then got into the job because he applied for this and yeah. I feel like it was luck he landed on his feet really yeah. didn't he yeah, yeah completely even though like he just got a tweet from the BBC through the F Factor thing but not everyone will go to the F Factor and then get a tweet so I feel like even though he could relate to some bit but it took so long for him to relate to to relate it to media and journalism and the audience were media and journalism students so it's like what part do we come in into because it's a good story to hear for motivation it's a conversation for everyone you don't have to be in media and journalism industry but if we are journalism and media students so it was like where do we relate to it i would say he getting a tweet from bbc was truly luck um maybe because he was on the x factor and all of that but i would still consider it as luck yeah no i know what you mean i just think mm. it did i don't know it was it was a nice speech it was nice to have him in and but it really wasn't very like relatable was it no. that was that was probably the journalism side it it wasn't very relatable cause for like probably none of us <laughs> will go on to the x factor <laughs> after we graduate i mean maybe but yeah i feel like it wasn't very oh this is you know i did this and this is where that got me it was sort of like i went on the x factor and got a tweet from bbc okay. That's yeah. how I land. It wasn't as journalism focused as other podcasts have been, don't you guys think? It wasn't majorly journalism. It was more focused on his life, and I think that's the reason the talk was open for all. Yeah, and anyone and everyone could just come and listen. It wasn't to him. a journalism yeah. focused yeah. talk, was it? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it would be so much better if he just came in and was like, okay, I would just when he spoke about sitting down at home and then don't know what to do after X Factor, it would be so much better if he just said something. It was something about oh. I don't know what to do and just like oh I saw this application just applied and then I got in I didn't think I would get in but for him to just sit down bored and then just get a tweet like I don't I, don't, I wouldn't go on X Factor or tweet or say my life story on social media or like that to get a tweet that oh come on I want to interview you or something like that I think he should have rather just cut his life story short and told us about more after he got a tweet from BBC and then he went on to BBC and what he did after that yeah, sort of how he got promoted as well. Like, cause obviously, I know he's worked his way up. That would have been helpful if he sort of went into detail about, oh, you know, I, I mean, I know he covered sort of, I did, I was always the best in the room, I think he said at one point, which was good. But how were you the best in the room? What did you do? Yeah, yeah. I feel like he could have gone more in depth with the whole journey. Like tips and tricks. Yeah, sort of tips, yeah. Room, yeah. Like, if you do this, it's going to really help you. And I feel like it wasn't really about that. It was more about sort of his foster like bring in and over the past five years i have been extremely fortunate um i have covered some of the biggest stories i was one of the key correspondents on the grenfell tower fire so on the morning of the fire i was sent as one of the key reporters to interview survivors i got nominated for royal television society award for my grenfell work as young talent of the year in 2018 i was sent to russia as a digital reporter um, during the World Cup, where I got to interview Rio Ferdinand, I'm from Peckham. Can you, he's from Peckham, by the way, so that's a pretty big deal. Um, and yeah, like, heaps of stuff on Brexit, of course. And a key beat, a key part of what I do as a journalist is essentially originate stories that um, reflect parts of society that you don't normally see covered in the news. If you like giving a voice to those who don't have a platform. So I've used my story a lot to do journalism. I've done heaps of stories and investigations on the care system. And I'm in a really interesting space now because um, I do a lot for The One Show. I presented it last year. I present films for The One Show. Um, I had a show go out with Kim. Who knows Kim Marsh? Comedy star. But when she left, we did a show together about online romance for, for BBC One. Anyway, I'm not just spouting out my achievements to kind of look good. That's not why I've come, come from London, but it's to say that, had you told me as a, if you told me that when I was 16, or even 20, that I would one day become a BBC News correspondent and a BBC One presenter, I would have laughed in your face and thought you were taking the mic. Because I was so consumed with the pain and trauma of being a care, a care kid and a care leaver, that I never thought the BBC would be open to someone like me. Despite going to Cambridge University and all of the privilege that offered, I never thought I had what it took to become a journalist. It literally took the BBC, it took BBC to be tweeting me to even think that I could do something in front of the camera. And so I just really want to make this point and I really hope that it encourages you that as you are here at this formative stage in your lives, as you're thinking about potential careers in the media, to not write yourself 
off from the higher echelons of media. I think that broadcasting and the media is richer when it is diverse. Because when we have diverse newsrooms, when we have diverse teams, we're going to create output and content that will better serve the UK and our society. So, as we know, Ashley now works for the BBC. He's a correspondent. He helps present The One Show. He has quite a few achievements going on and... You know, we've obviously heard his life story and his speech and everything. What did you guys think of the speech and Ashley overall? I think his speech was mainly focused on his life, which is, you know, that's a fair enough. But for probably a journalism point of view, it wasn't very helpful in the sense of, you know, the career side, I'd say. It was sort of more sort of focused on just his life, which is obviously a personal thing. So I don't feel like maybe a couple of people could relate to certain things, but I don't feel anyone could relate specifically the whole x factor and the tweet thing like that's how i got it i don't feel like many people would be able to relate and i don't feel like he went in depth enough with the you know journalism. the journalism side yeah. yeah and i feel like that probably would have helped a little bit more like the grand Tower, that's a, that's you know that's an amazing achievement yeah. for oh, a journalist I love to hear more oh yeah about that. i would have loved to have sort of heard like you know in depth yeah like points about it but i feel like he sort of just touched on it and then on, that, on to the next thing yeah and I feel like that sort of let him down a little bit. But it was it was good. It was it was good and it was motivational. That's what I would call the Take speech really. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Personally I feel like he he has a really good stage presence, but that is not enough as in because we are media and journalism students and he was just talking about East Life and how we quite interesting, but I would like to relate to it more. I feel like it's more relatable for people that have been to foster home and stuff like that and people who are planning to give up in life to help them get back up. But for me personally, it's not relatable to me because where I'm in life, I'm gonna finish uni soon and I want to I want to hear stuff about the real world, about how to work in the real world. I don't wanna hear about how you got where you got to, um, by luck. I'm not trying to be rude about it, but No, I get where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, me like too. You're talking about you, but it's not about you, it's about the people listening to you. We want to know how you got there. I we, didn't, yeah, yeah, we didn't yeah, take yeah, much yeah. advice yeah. from it. It wasn't not very helpful to us. Wise, yeah, yeah, career advice. Yeah, yeah I definitely. Would like I would just say that he was, because he did not tell us much about the journalism part of it, I couldn't actually relate to the talk because I haven't been to a foster home ever. Yeah. I haven't. I mean, being from India, we don't use, like, our parents keep us close to themselves and all of that. I, I couldn't much relate. I think what I wanted to listen to was how he went into BBC, how easy or difficult was it for him to adjust, how did he get on with work, and how did he learn from them? I wanted to hear more sort of about his experiences while being a journalist. Well, rather than experiences before he was a journalist. Sort yeah, of thing. like, as you said, yeah. the Grenfell Tower would be really good to hear about and he was on a TV show he said yeah the Victoria and he was put, show. and he was put forwards for was it the he got like an award the young yeah the young talent of the year 2018 but I don't think he got that but he was put forward for it but I would it's have, nice to know like yeah those steps that get you to those things because yeah. us four don't know I feel like it would have been more helpful yeah if he sort of guided us in the right direction maybe yeah just Absolutely. sort of tips what you learned, like how you became a professional reporter, presenter, I would like to hear that bit. I would also yeah. like to mention that he only went on talking about all the positive things that he did and not about... Like I'm, the challenges. Yeah, about yeah, the challenges, challenges that downfalls. That I mean, I challenges in the journalism, journalism yeah. industry. And not yeah. before that. Not in his exactly. life previous, Like Just to end, I just want to say thank you to the University of Northampton and Changemaker Hub, I believe, that's yeah, organised organize, yeah. the podcast. And thank you to Ashley for coming in and Hillary, our lecturer, for organising it. And um, next week there'll be another podcast with Olivia from Presspad as well, so make sure you listen to that. And thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you.